Amen. All right. This week we're in Genesis chapter number 37. We're going to begin reading or jump right into it. Verse number 1. The Bible reads, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Now, if you remember correctly, initially when he had uh, moved to the land of Canaan, he was dwelling in the area of Shechem. If you back up, though, to Genesis chapter number 35, verse number 27, it tells us this. It says, And Jacob came unto Isaac his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourn. So this is actually where Jacob is living now. We're going to see here in a minute, if you have been uh, paying attention there while Brother Russell was reading, it says that he, they left, or uh, when Joseph leaves to go seek for his brethren, and to bring back a report on them that they had left from the Vale of Hebron. So uh, at some point or another, he ended up leaving from Shechem. And it may have may very well have been when he went and buried his father. He might have stayed in the area of Hebron. So he obviously moved at one time or another. That makes sense. We also know that from Genesis chapter number 36. Uh, if you remember, it says that Esau and Jacob were dwelling by one another. And Esau ended up leaving. So before that, they weren't dwelling together. It makes perfect sense that probably when he went and buried his father, he may have stayed around in the area of Hebron at that time. And then uh, later on, Esau himself left. So now he, he is living in the land of Hebron. That's why we see here in verse number 1, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. He's specifically in the land of Hebron now, where uh, the specific part of Canaan, because Canaan is a huge you know, that's the, basically the entire country of Israel at that time, ge geographically. But Hebron specifically is a city, and that's where he's living now. Look at verse 2, it says this, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father... Their evil report. So here we see an actual introduction to the character of Joseph. Now here for quite a few chapters, the Bible, pretty much to the end of uh, the book of Genesis, the Bible is going to be focusing on, he's going to be the, the central theme of the book of Genesis going forward. It will be uh, the son of Jacob, which is, jo which is Joseph. Here at the end you'll notice there, or, or right after it uh, mentions his name, Joseph, it tells you the age when he's being introduced. It says being 17 Years old. So what we're about to read about happens when he's at the age of 17 years old. Another thing that's interesting is we can get definition of definitions of words. It says the lad. Notice that 17 years old, that is a lad. Not only that, I want to focus on the content of this verse. It says down there at the bottom, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just read it all through one more time. These are the generations of Jacob, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, here in the next couple of verses, we're going to see that uh, Joseph is basically the apple of Jacob's eye. Joseph is the child that, that uh, Jacob loves. And we see this uh, throughout the book of Genesis occurring with, with, with uh, relationships between fathers and sons a few different times. Here at the end, notice it says, And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Right? A lot of times when, uh, when people will hear about something like this happening, someone bringing an, uh, an evil report on someone else, maybe if you're there when someone's doing something bad, maybe even brethren, right? Uh, a physical uh, and biological brethren, maybe one brother or two brothers are, are participating in some sort of illegal activity in their household, right? Something bad that they should be doing that their parents uh, don't want them doing. Maybe one of them will go and tell their parents, right? Uh, there's a, a word for this, a snitch or a rat. What people will, will, will do is they'll try to look down upon the, these types of people that are bringing an evil report. I want to uh, uh, you know, make it very clear that there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And this is partially, I'm sure, why his brethren don't like him. We're going to see that here in just a moment. I believe that Joseph seems to be a very righteous man. I believe that Joseph seems to be, in a lot of ways, to be a righteous man. Of course, God is with him. He gives him uh, these, these visions and these dreams. He uses him as a great prophet. And what's going on here is his brethren are very wicked. And we've seen how Jacob's sons can be. We, we know about Reuben. Of course, it mentions that in Genesis 49. 
going in into his father's uh, uh, concubine, right? We know about Simeon and Levi. I mean, there's, they're basically just, uh, you know, each chapter speaks of a different sin that one of his sons are committing. So by and large, there are numerous different uh, uh, downfalls. Of course, we're all centered and learn that, but they, do, they commit some very wicked acts. So by and large, we're told about a lot of sins that they commit. And you see, what you see here is you see Joseph who's being righteous, and he witnesses something that he knows that his brethren should not be doing, should not be participating in, and then he goes and he tells his father. There's nothing wrong with that at all. You know, the world will say, hey, you're a snitch, you're a rat, all these different types of things. I wanted to use the, the negative connotation, you know, uh, types of words that they use. There's nothing wrong with this. If you see someone doing something that they shouldn't be doing, and, uh, you know, uh, let's say that there's an authority, whether it be the job, whether you are a child. If one of your brothers and sisters are participating in something that is sinful or something specifically that your father or your mother said don't do, you better go tell your parents right then. You better go let them know of the evil report that your, uh, you know, that your brethren or your brothers, sisters, whoever it is. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't let people shame you for that. Maybe if someone's doing something they shouldn't be doing at work. You need to go tell whoever that authority is at work, the boss. If somebody's doing something, you're stealing from... You know, imagine you know, a, an extreme situation. If you're a partner with someone else, and they're going into somebody's house, and they're stealing or taking things away, what are you going to say, I don't want to be a snitch, I don't want to be a rat? It's ridiculous, right? You need, to, you need to make sure that you report those types of things. And the world is so screwed up and so backwards, and they always try to make uh, the person that does something righteous, who's being the good person, the good guy, right? They're, they're, you know, they're the snitch. They're the rat. You know, they try to make a rat. I mean, think about that. How, how, how low they try to make you to be, right? You know, there's, there, you know that's, that's the right thing to do if someone is committing some sort of sin. You know, uh, you need to go tell the authority in that situation. I'm not telling you to go start calling the cops, right? That's not what I'm speaking about. Totally different type of, of situation. Look at what it says in verse number three. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. So here the Bible tells us that uh, Jacob has some great, some strong favoritism towards his son, Joseph, doesn't he? It also tells us the reason why. It says because he was the son of his old age. Now that's an interesting statement. It kind of makes me think about how grandparents are towards their children. Maybe it's kind of like that when, when grandparents, when, when people get older, you know, they seem to become more laid back and lax. Maybe it has something to do with that. That's interesting. Uh, it, it also may be tied in with it. It would make sense that it, it's to do with Rachel, of course. But specifically, it tells you that it is because it is the son of his old age. That meant a lot to him. Maybe he didn't think he was going to be able to have any more children. We know they had Benjamin later on as well. But that meant a lot to him, obviously, to bring forth this child in his old age. Then it tells you afterwards, and this will become relevant in just a moment, and he made him a coat of many colors. Now, a coat of many colors, this would be like what James 2 talks about. You want a perfect example of gay clothing. That's what this is. Gay clothing, something that's flashy, something that's bright, something that's colorful. That's expensive normally. That's something that people would desire. Now, you know, uh, it, it, it lines up too perfectly with people that wear gay clothing today, right? This whole month, we've seen a lot of like, you know, different types of gay clothing, people wearing the, you know, uh, the, the, the rainbow flag everywhere. But that's what I picture, and that's what most people will illustrate when they draw the type of coat that he has. <clears throat> it's a coat of many colors. It's probably bright colors. It's probably not, you know, dull colors like browns and things like that. It's probably bright colors. And that would make perfect sense, a coat of many colors. I want you to turn with me, though, to Genesis chapter number 49. Genesis chapter number 49. I'm going to get into something that we're going to be spending the majority of uh, this chapter on. We're going to, of course, be going through and seeing what happens when Joseph is so sold into slavery, into Egypt by his brethren. That's really the theme of this chapter. He's sold into slavery. He's sold into Egypt uh, by his brethren. But one of the main things I'm going to be doing while we walk through the literal interpretation of what's going on with Joseph and each particular uh, thing that takes place, each circumstance, we're also going to see the strong parallel with Joseph and Jesus all throughout this chapter. And we're going to see this a lot. Now, Joseph is probably the strongest picture of Christ in the Bible. Uh, there are so many parallels with Joseph. It is amazing. And you can study it, and you just continually find new things all the time. And this chapter is just packed, filled with things that are, are 
far, you know, uh, uh, much further than uh, the possibility of just being a coincidence. It's just amazing some of the things that are in this chapter. I want to show you the association right here. I'm not going to uh, elaborate on this. I have an opinion about this now. But I'm going to show you an association with Joseph and Jesus here within just a couple of chapters. It's very interesting. Look at Genesis chapter 49. Uh, verse number, we'll read through verse 22 and down. It says this, Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a wall, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow <coughs> abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Then it says this in parentheses, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Let me ask you this question, who's the shepherd of Israel? Who's the stone of Israel? It's, of course, Jesus. So you see the close association, too, here, Joseph and Jesus. When we walk down through, there are going to be so many parallels with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is a great picture and a great symbolism of the Lord Jesus Christ to come. Of course, we know that the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, it's about Jesus. Jesus, prophetically speaking, he says, uh, Lo, I come, he says, in the volume of the book it is written of me. You know, everything in the Bible points to Jesus. He is, he is uh, uh, the purpose of life. He is, uh, you know, uh, the purpose of the, the scriptures, the study out that we might know him better and know who Jesus Christ is and we might glorify him better by the knowledge that we obtain. Look at verse number uh, four now. Back in Genesis 37, verse number four. It says this, And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, it says they hated him. And could not speak peaceably unto him. So we can see the type of relationship that Joseph has with his brethren now. Of course they are envious. That's very obvious why uh, they hate him. is because they're envious of him. Verse number 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream. And he told it his brethren. And they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose. And also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance. That means to bow down to my sheep. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So, of course, the dream is that they're out of the field and maybe they're, they're, they're cutting up some sort of wheat. And then they're putting it into bundles. That's what sheaves are, right? They're putting it into bundles. And it says that they, they all have their bundles, you know, stacked up. And then Joseph's in, would seem to be in the middle here. And it says that Joseph's bundle or sheaf stands upright. And then all the other sheaves, the sheaves of the 11 brethren, they bow down unto Joseph's sheep. That's what took place. Notice what it said there at the end of verse number 8. It says, and they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Look at verse number 9. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him, and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? So at this time, of course, his father rebuking him, this is just his, his son coming to him. He has no idea that Joseph actually has a gift from God. We're, of course, going to discover this uh, here throughout the book of Genesis, in the latter portion of the book of Genesis, where he is able to prophesy through these dreams things that are going to take place in the future. And he even says, hey, the interpretation is of God. He says, it's not coming from me. This is, of course, a gift from God. And this particular vision is the same. This particular dream is actually a prophecy of what's going to take place in the future. And there is a literal, immediate application to this. Because this actually happens. We're going to see later on that Joseph, when he sold into slavery into Egypt, his brethren end up coming to him. And the 11 brethren, all of his 11 brothers come and they bow down to him. So this is literally fulfilled. Not only that, we see here uh, in the second dream, it says that his father and his mother also are going to bow down to him. Now, I want to get into real quickly uh, one of the uh, spiritual applications of this, one of the parallels with Jesus. Go back to Genesis 49. Genesis chapter number 49. 
very interesting. Here in Genesis chapter number 49, verse number 8, one of the prophecies about uh, Judah, in, in the same way that it's worded, I want you to watch this, verse number 8, it says this, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. So this is, of course, the, the prophecies that are given from Jacob. This is the word of God that he's speaking. And notice what it says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. And then it says this, thy father's children, watch this, shall bow down before thee. Now, who's his father's children? Well, that, of course, would be referring to, he, he is his father, the one that's speaking, Jacob. But what we saw before we were, when we were reading was about uh, a literal application, of course, that took place of Joseph. But there's also, here's further proof of that spiritual application and a secondary application of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because who ultimately is this fulfilled through? If we look at the vision and the dream of Joseph, and in the far, far future, we see when all of Israel, right, the children of Israel have to bow down, who do they bow down before? Every Israelite that has ever lived will bow down to the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll bow down to he who came from the seed of Judah, specifically. Not only that, it's very interesting what is used in the illustration, in the dream that's given to Joseph. Notice it says the 11 stars, right? Then it says the sun and the moon. Well, in Revelation chapter number 12, there's a similar type of vision that's given. It says that there's a woman that's clothed with the sun. And then it says the moon is under her feet. And then it says that she has a crown on her head of what? Of 12 stars. All the thing, same uh, things are, 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 are present. You notice that? And then who is born at that moment? The Lord Jesus Christ. All before, right before all of these things. And remember, the sun, the moon, and the stars in the vision of Joseph, they bow down to, uh, 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 to uh, specifically Joseph, that is. So we see there that spiritual application being applied unto the Lord Jesus Christ with every single thing being present. Not only that, in Genesis chapter number 37, verse number 8, notice the wording, it says, And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Now, who is going to reign and rule over and have dominion over the nation of Israel? All of Israel, all the children of Israel. Of course, again, the Lord Jesus Christ. It says he, he's going to have a dominion that is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away, right? And where is he going to be reigning? He's going to be reigning in Israel. He's going to be reigning over the house of Israel. He's going to be reigning in New Jerusalem. So we see another application there, of course, replying uh, to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep reading there. Look at verse number 11. It says this. And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. So notice there you're told why they hate him. That it's because of envy. And we've dealt with pretty much every sin that exists almost already in the book of Genesis. Uh, we've seen the consequences of every type of sin. And in this chapter, we're also going to see the consequences of envy and the great uh, 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 measures that it will push someone to when they envy someone. Look at verse number um, 12 now. It says this, And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. So notice they're not dwelling in Shechem anymore. That's, that's an important point like I had mentioned earlier. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. That's the type of attitude that people need to have when, when our Heavenly Father, you know, uh, sends us forth to go soul winning, which is a, a commandment to everyone. You need to have the attitude, here am I. You need to be ready to go forth and, and do work for God. You need to be ready just like, uh, just like Samuel. You know, when Samuel's there, what does he say? Almost exactly the same type of statement, right? Said, and, and then uh, Isaiah says the same thing. Here am I, Lord, send me. Right? Over and over again, this statement is found all throughout the Bible. You see the willingness uh, and the, the volunteering to go forth and preach the gospel or to do the work of God. Yeah. Look at verse 14. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron. Vale means like valley, it's just like the word dale. So it's the valley of Hebron. And he came to Shechem. Now what this is a picture of, with applying it to the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Father sending the Son into the world to do his work. That's why he said, here am I, right? And where is he going? He's going out to the sheep. He's going out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, where did he go? He said specifically that he is, he, he's not going anywhere. He's sent unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And isn't it funny that who's out in the wilderness? There's sheep there, and then you have the, the house of Israel out there. 
and he's being sent out into the field. What's the field? The world, right? It's just like the Lord Jesus Christ being sent into the world. Keep looking there at verse number 15. It says, And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering, look at this, in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Notice that. I seek my brethren. That's the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dathan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired. They conspired against him to slay him. Now I want to show you an extremely interesting parallel you may have not uh, uh, noticed before. Why don't you go to Matthew chapter number 21. Matthew chapter number 21. So <clears throat> we're going to see a, a very strong uh, uh, a parallel here, a parallel passage. Matthew chapter number 21. We just recently read this too, so it may be fresh in your mind. Matthew chapter number 21 <clears throat> says this. Matthew chapter number 21 Verse number 33, here another parable. There was a certain householder, that could be Jacob in this case, which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and dig a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. When the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husband that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, that be Joseph. And then it says this. They said among themselves, this is the heir. This is the heir. Look what it says next. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. It says, and they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbands? So you have almost an identical situation where you have, you know, uh, the father Jacob, right? which would be you know, the father in this parable, and this uh, parable is God in heaven. What does he do? He sends forth his son. Jacob sent forth Joseph. God the father sent forth who? He sent forth Jesus, right? He sends him out into the field, and where does he go? They both go to Israel, both of them. Joseph goes to the 11 tribes of Israel. Where does Jesus go? He goes also to the tribes of Israel. Both of them go there, and what happens? They both end up being rejected, and we're going to read about how, of course, Jesus ends up being, being uh, killed. We know that. We're going to read about Joseph, who ends up being rejected and then, of course, uh, sold into slavery. So it's almost an identical uh, parallel with what takes place, showing, of course, the consistency again when we side-by-side -side compare what took place with Jesus Christ and then uh, Joseph uh, uh, in his life, the strong parallel between them both. Go back to Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis chapter number 37, we'll see a couple more of these. Uh, it, it tells us this in verse number uh, 19. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. It's the exact same language uh, that was used when the men in the vineyard were speaking to one another, right? They were talking about they wanted to slay him. And it's the same, same type of mentality. They're conspiring together. Also, uh, if we want to uh, point out verse number 19, we try to get an application from each verse. Notice it says, Behold, this dreamer cometh. What are they doing? They're mocking him. What did they do to the Lord Jesus Christ? When he was on the cross, for example. You know, one of the other themes, it says he cast the same in his teeth. What's he doing? He was mocking him. It says people, they, they walk by and they wag their head. You know, there was men that stood by that said, you know, uh, you know uh, others he saved himself, he cannot save, right? If, if, if you're the Christ, come down, right? What are they doing? They're making fun of him and they're mocking him. Even if you uh, uh, go as far as to think about the Roman soldiers, what did they do to Jesus? They mocked him. They, they smote him right uh, uh, right in the face. And then they, and it says they buffed him. And then they asked him the question, prophesy unto us. Tell us who smote thee, right, O king? And so uh, what were they doing? They were mocking him, just like Joseph being mocked. This dreamer coming. What are they doing? They're making fun of him. They're mocking him just like the Lord Jesus Christ was mocked. <clears throat> Look at verse uh, 20 one more time. It says, Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast in him into some pit and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him 
to his father again. So, of course, Reuben here is he's the oldest son. That makes perfect sense to me. He's the most mature. Uh, he's trying to save his brother out of their hands. So he's trying to act like he's going along with what they're doing. But he's actually also behind the scenes basically setting it up so that he can, he can save Joseph. He's like, yeah, well, let's not do that. Let's not hurt him. Let's just throw him in this pit. But really, he has a plan so that he can come back later and deliver him. Look at verse 23. It says, And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren, it says this, that they stripped Joseph of, out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. Flip over with me to Matthew chapter number 27. So we're going to go to Matthew 27 a few times. Go over to Matthew 27. We'll see something similar that took place with the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Matthew chapter number 27. It says they stripped him out of his coat. Look at Matthew 27, verse number 27. It says this. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And then it says in verse 28, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. So, Notice that they replaced it with a scarlet robe. So what did he have on before that? He had on a robe, right? What is a robe? Another word for a robe. Be a coat, right? What did they do to Joseph? They stripped him of his coat or his robe. We see the pictures of, of Joseph. What does it look like when people draw? Yeah, you know, they draw what would be a coat. Because that's what a robe is. A, coat, a robe <clears throat> is a type of coat. So we can see this taking place with Joseph. And then the exact same thing took place with Jesus you know, uh, in his life right before the crucifixion. So these things were foreshadowing what was ultimately going to take place with the Lord Jesus Christ. This whole scenario. It says also in, uh, uh, go to Matthew 27. I want you to look with me in verse number 18. Look at the reason why uh, they did this to Jesus. Matthew 27, 18, it says, uh, this is Pilate, about Pilate, the Holy Spirit about Pilate. It says, for he knew that for what? For envy they had delivered him. So what was the reason why he was delivered? Uh, they wanted to slay him and they conspired. What was it? It was for envy. Well, who, who delivered him? It was the house of Israel. Well, who took Joseph and did that to Joseph? Well, it was, the, it was the, the, the 11 tribes of Israel. It was the tribes of Israel. Notice the parallel, the super strong parallel here. Uh, it's the same, you know, John chapter number 1, I can't remember exactly what verse it is, but it tells us he came unto his own and his own received him not. And then, you know, the, uh, so it would be verse 11, because verse 12, of course, but as many as received him, to them he gave you power to become the sons of God. So, notice it says, he came unto his own. Who's his own? He's talking about he was, he was of the line of Judah. He was of the house of Israel. He came unto them, it says, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. What did Joseph do? He went out into the wilderness, searching for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came unto them, and he was sent from the Father. And what did they do? It says it. His own received him not. It says that his own received him not. What was it? It was his brethren. Who was, who was Jesus rejected by? He was rejected by his own. He was rejected by his brethren. He was sent by the Father to seek out the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And they took him and they rejected him. They took him and they stripped off his coat. What did they do to Joseph? They took him and they stripped off his coat, right? Look at verse number 24. It says, And they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. What's the pit in the Bible all the time? <clears throat> Excuse me. That's something in my throat. What's the pit in the Bible? Hell. It's always hell, right? Every time. I want you to turn with me. Go to Luke chapter number 16 with me. Luke chapter number 16. Now, if you were to notice there, it says, And they took him and cast him into a pit. And then it says, And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. There was no water in it. We have uh, in the New Testament a story about a man that goes to hell interesting one of the statements that, that the man makes. Look at Luke chapter number 16. Look at verse number uh, 19. It says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. Verse 21, And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bo bosom. The rich man also died and was, in, and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. So where is he? He's in hell. It says, And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, watch this, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented 
in this flame. What is hell? What is there? Of course, it is fire. What is obviously something that's not there that this man desires? What is it? Water. Now, isn't it interesting that when Joseph is cast into this pit, which of course the pit is always talking about hell, it tells you that, specifically look at Genesis 37. I'm in Exodus 37. I don't know how that happened. Genesis chapter number 37, verse number um, 24. It says at the very end, there was no water in it. You know what else? You know what else? You know what it isn't in the other pit in hell? There's no water there. That's why the rich man is, is screaming and crying and he's saying, hey, tell Lazarus, you know, to go and dip his, his finger in water that he may cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Why? Because there's no water in it. There's no water in the pits of hell. Look at verse number 25. It says, And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. Now watch this. It's interesting. Verse 26. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Verse 27. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Now, who's the one that came up with this idea to do this? What's his name? Who's the brother? The brother of the 11 tribes that says, hey, let's sell him. Who is it? Judah, right? You know what one of the New Testament names for Judah is? In the New Testament, does anyone know? Judas. Judas. Look at verse number 28. It says, Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph in to Egypt. Go to Matthew chapter number 27, verse number 3. Matthew chapter number 27, verse number 3. Matthew chapter number 27, look at verse number 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. So, of course, in the New Testament we see Judas betraying Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. In the Old Testament, what do we see? We see Judah betraying Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. Very, very strong consistency here. There is no... You know, there's no way that you can say, hey, I don't think that Joseph's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's by far the greatest picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's all these little nuggets, you know, just overlaid throughout uh, uh, the story of Joseph. It's, it's not only here in chapter 37, it's all through the rest of the book. Look at verse number 29. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. And he rent his clothes, and he returned unto his brethren and said, the child is not. And I, whither shall I go? So notice he said, the child is not. What does he think happened? He's saying he thinks he's dead. Well, you know what a lot of people did when Jesus died too? They rent their clothes, right? He talks about him renting the mantle. Keep reading there. Verse number 31. And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. So notice Joseph has a coat. And what does his coat look like? It's dipped in blood. Why don't you go to Revelation chapter number 19. We'll look at Jesus' coat. Revelation chapter number 19. Revelation chapter number 19. Look at verse number... Look at verse number 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So notice he has a vesture, and vesture is another word for coat. I can actually show you where it's clearly used. <clears throat> Synonymous, actually, when it's uh, uh, speaking, I, I think it's in the book of Matthew. I'll show you afterwards. I didn't look it up. But uh, they it says that they uh, they take his coat or something along those lines, and they they uh, distribute it out among them. And then, it, I, I believe this is how it's worded, but uh, I'll have to look it up afterwards. It says that they take this coat, they distribute it out among them, and they cast lots for Jesus' coat. And then it quotes a prophecy, and it's used interchangeable with his vesture. Right? So a coat is a vesture. So, so here we see that Joseph has a coat. And what does it look like? It's dipped in blood, isn't it? We saw that Jesus has a coat. When he comes back, and what's going on with his coat? It's also dipped in blood. So... Uh, there's these amazing parallels between the two. Uh, look there in verse number 
32 now. Verse number 32. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. It says, And he knew it, and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without, de without, without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. <clears throat> but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. A couple of things just to, to, to end tonight on. Number one, we keep overlooking. It's so easy for us when we're reading the stories in the Bible to overlook the vast wickedness that's going on here. They took their brother. They kidnapped their, their younger brother. Imagine this taking place in your family to try to put it into perspective. They kidnapped their younger brother, and they were about to kill him. But they decided, hey, let's not kill him. Let's sell him into slavery. Do you know what the, the punishment for kidnapping is in the, the law of God? It's death. It is a very serious crime. All of his brethren were complicit in this. Every last one of them. So over and over and over again, we see the, you know, uh, uh, the children of Israel, just mankind in general, just from the beginning of the book of Genesis. It makes me wonder whether, you know, uh, especially like pastors of churches, of course the people that aren't saved, whether they even actually sit down and read their Bible when they say, yeah, you've got to be a good person. You know, uh, you know, that just the idea that it's possible for man to live a righteous enough life. It's like they don't understand the sinful nature of just mankind in general. Now, of course, they did extremely wicked things, and uh, it just shows that they don't understand further the, the, uh, the true way of salvation. Because they would say, yeah, the children of Israel, they were saved. You know, the 11 tribes of Israel. But then they'll tell you, hey, you, know, you can't do this, you can't do that, or you'll never make it to heaven. Did you read the types of things that they did in their life? Do you believe that they're saved? you believe that adulterers are saved? you believe that kidnappers are saved? you believe that this is the 11 sons of Israel? These are all things that they did. Murderers. I mean, it just goes on and on. Not only adultery, not only, not only murder and all of these things, you have Reuben going in unto his father's wife. That is wicked as hell. I mean, just extreme sins. These aren't just minor sins. Extreme sins. And of that same line of Judah, even, we're going to see something horrible that he does in the next chapter. The Lord Jesus Christ came, of course. Right? So that shows that, of course, God is able to uh, use even a sinner. But when we look back and we look at, you know, um, the book of Genesis, every chapter, one thing I want to impress upon you each week, every chapter is just packed filled with the sinful nature of man. What does it start off with, Adam and Eve? Their, their, their unrighteousness, right? That's, the, that's how you would just basically categorize or, or summarize, really. Summarize uh, the story of Adam and Eve. It's the fall. Fall of mankind. Why? Because they're unrighteous. They're sinful. They can't keep God's law. Genesis chapter 6. God destroys the whole world because of the wickedness. Then God starts using someone. Abraham. He starts using Isaac. He starts using Jacob. And it's just like major sin after major sin after major sin after major sin. What it, what it should do is it should make you understand you have the same flesh. And I've said this many times, but it's still very important. You have a lot of these, you have all of these same capabilities that dwell in your flesh. You do not think that you're above all of these things and, and you know, you could never fall into these sins, right? You know, the, the Bible warns that if a man thinks that he stands, you need to take heed lest you fall, right? So we can learn from that aspect when we read about just these horrific sins that are going on over and over and over again. And here we see kidnapping where they're about to kill their little brother. They're going to murder their brother. Then they go to their father and they lie to him. And their, brother, their father is mourning for months, maybe years over this. Just mourning every day to the point of depression where he wants to die. And they're just standing there and they lie to their father about that. That's wicked, man. Super sinful and super wicked. And you can read over this stuff and it just goes right over your head sometimes. What all of those men did, every one of them, Reuben, they all knew what happened with Joseph, and they knew where Joseph was. 
to some degree. They knew that slaves, he's probably working as a slave somewhere, or he's dead now. You know, because you know, a lot of times by, you know, uh, by reason of the work that they're made to do and the way they're treated, sometimes slaves will die. That's very common, right? So, but they knew that, hey, he wasn't torn by a beast. Hey, we did this. And they were, and it was actually by their own wicked hands, right? Just like you think of, of the verse about Jesus, they're taken by wicked hands, right? Right? So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes you can become gullible. To your own, you know, to your own flesh. You can read these stories and not really apply, not really see what's going on. What they did was extremely and horribly wicked. One other application we'll end on this, a spiritual application, is uh, we see that this is clearly uh, prophesying uh, of or, or paralleling, if you will, the death, the coming death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, it, it likely is thrown down into the pit. That's you know, uh, I believe it's extremely clear that this is a look into uh, the Lord Jesus Christ died. And then we see at the end, uh, you know, the Father mourning. And I believe that, that that's put in there. And there's all symbolism for all these things because mm, Jesus didn't go through the motions. Jesus really died, right? And I believe it was a real relationship between the Father and between the Son. We can't overlook that, right? And I'm sure, just because the Bible says that the Father loved the Son. He had real emotions toward the Son. How do you think he felt, felt when his son, when that son that he loved was dying on the cross? <clears throat> I'm sure it hurt him. I'm sure he felt probably very similar to how Jacob felt when he heard about Joseph. And so there's, there's spiritual application to all of this. What do we see here? We see just Joseph being an extremely strong picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it shows us just all the great and vast nuggets that are in the Bible. We see just the amazing uh, um, uh, the amazing aspect of Scripture and so much of how deep it is. No man could ever, could ever sit down and compile a book like this. It's not possible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the Bible. We thank you, dear Lord, for uh, all of just the, uh, uh, just the, the deep and amazing, um, uh, as I said, nuggets that are, that are there, dear Lord, for us to learn from and study. Of course, it's interesting. Help us to love all the Bible, though, uh, not the things that are, are obviously interesting uh, to the majority, but help us just to love all of it. We thank you for the whole book of Genesis. We ask you that you would uh, put in us a zeal for the word and that we would read it every day, that we would study it, uh, that we would pray to you every day to strengthen our Christianity each day. And as I said, thank you for this church and uh, bless all the families here and all the children. And, uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen.